Storygram Network. Hosting for this podcast is generously provided by Transistor at Transistor.fm. Hi, my name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. So it's not about food, and it's not about weight. What is it about? Everything else. Because it's never ever about food. Or weight. Never ever. Not even. One time. Not ever. Ever ever. Hello everyone. This is Laura Lee Rourke from It's Not About Food podcast. And today we are talking about sexuality. So the front of the card is the goddess is dancing and she's dancing next to the deer. She's sort of like all in herself. And so is the little animal. I feel like this is a card about, that's right, I got it going on. (laughs) Kind of a feeling about it. Very much in her power of her sexuality. And so the back of the card reads... Our relationship with food, body size, and sexuality are complex. By exploring the link between negative body image and sexual shame, we can begin to respect and love our own unique beauty and then hold our bodies and sexuality as sacred. We can then reclaim our sexuality for ourselves as the pure, precious, and honorable force it is. And what a wonderful way it would be if we were all in this world able to do this. I feel body image disturbances would stop, uh, eating disorders would stop, rape, molestation, incest would stop, you know, using our bodies as commodities to sell products would stop. So many things would be able to be different if we could just reclaim our sexuality for ourselves as the pure, precious, honorable force that it is. And how do we even do that in the culture that we live in? How do we even step into that powerful circle and leave the negative body image and sexual shame behind? It's a process, you know, for many of us. And Some of us have been hurt worse than others, that's for sure. But it is a very hard thing to do in the culture we live in where we use the female body and the male body to sell everything from car tires to (laughs) housing. (laughs) You know, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. So I'm really happy to have Megan with me here today. I've known her for a long time. She was in our peer ed program. Many, I don't even know when that was, but it was many years ago. And I think we had her for a couple of years in the peer education program and just really a wonderful addition to our program and to the presentations. Very honest and open with, you know, what we were trying to get across to these young people and peer to peer saying, you can do this. You don't have to be the way that I was when I was your age, you know, and you were only like a couple years older. (laughs) It was great fun to see you and Jenny, you know, were always so great about coming and, and presenting Everywhere we went, it was fabulous. Anyway, so I want to introduce Megan so she can tell us what she's doing these days and why she picked this card and what's happening out in the world, out in your world. Hi. Yeah, so that was like 13 years ago because I'm 30 now. (laughs) Oh, my God. I still think I'm only only 30. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's so wild. I think I started with you guys when I was 17. And then, yeah, I must have been a junior. Yeah. And then I also did the senior year. And then I went to college. And I, but then I came back because I actually was struggling with some of the similar right. stuff and everything else in the world. I took a semester off school and I was, again, um, coming to your group. And I think also doing some peer ed with you guys again. Oh, and it was so just like, great. And, you know, that is so interesting to hear that even with all the knowledge that you had and going and teaching about this thing that you left home and went back into it. So what happened about that? Because you had all the information. 
I mean, it's just like almost humbles you because you think you're over something. And I was actually, I remember entering like college and looking down on other girls who were like talking about, you know, all the things that we talk about that we don't say, cause we're too mature to say that. And we know right. better, like I feel <laughs> fat and all that stuff. I'm like, God, it's so stupid. But yeah, in, in high school, like before I started working with you guys and during, I was a really serious ballet dancer. So that's kind of self-explanatory, like right. why <laughs> the obsession right. with food and weight, because it was like <laughs> part of my everyday, you know, existence and then really broke free from that. And then in college, I think like that was right around the time in the beginning of the wellness movement. Well, not the beginning, obviously, like, you know, back in like your generation, like you guys really started it with like <laughs> raw food and the what this and the that. But then the kind of more new age wellness, infrared sauna, soul cycle, like That's right. gluten free, dairy free stuff started. And I was like doing a yoga training and I think I just got like really obsessed, like sneakily with being healthy which I think they call orthorexia or whatever. And I was having some health problems. So I was like, oh, if I just cut out this and this and this, then I can control my health completely. I can balance my hormones. You know, like I can't eat any sugar, but it became again an obsession. And I thought I was doing it for the right reason. And then, yeah, it became this, you know, my body is a temple that is so pure <laughs> and nothing bad can enter it, which sounds great if you're like living on a mountaintop exactly. and meditating. But like I'm in New York City, like breathing. <laughs> 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 like toxic fumes and all day like trying to eat kale chips for lunch or whatever but yeah so that snuck back as like an orthorexia thing but it doesn't really matter what it is because it was like the mental state was that of complete obsession and there's no room for anything else and like there was no room for like we think the card sexuality like feeling sexual because you don't care about that stuff because you're just fixated on being like this perfect specimen that doesn't exist well to me it all makes sense what you're saying and that yeah i mean there's no room for sexuality or individuality or do i even like kelp chips kind of a <laughs> you know questioning of anything <laughs> That, that, that's a really deep question. <laughs> I think the answer is no. <laughs> right. And that whole crazy and the same thing that we've done to ourselves in this culture by listening to the advertising agencies that want to make us feel bad about ourselves. So we'll buy more kale chips or and I'm not even saying kale chips are wrong or bad or anything, but it's give it a rest, whatever it is, you know, because it's not life or death, but we take it as life or death. Like I have to be healthy, whatever that means, and well, whatever that means. And I kind of think that it means in this culture that you won't die. If you eat this way, you will be perfect and you won't die. You can control. Right. Yeah. And we're not supposed to feel sad or mad or bloated or angry or, or just whatever, like a person. Sick. Yeah. Like a yeah. human. There's no room for that. Totally. And I just feel like the what happened in the last 10 years is like this shift, which is kind of like, you know, an evolution away from the obsession with being thin to the obsession with being healthy and like probably is healthier to eat like grass fed meat and greens and not drink alcohol and all the things that are come with the wellness culture and like green juice or whatever, rather than like smoke cigarettes and drink black coffee. Like sure. It's probably healthier, but like the like contraction around the mental state around it is the same. And it's, I totally went through that like a few years ago, like dismantling maybe like six years ago now dismantling that and just feeling so much physically healthier, like eating much worse food, you know, technically worse food. Cause just not thinking so much about like, is this organic? And is this going to, is, is there a pesticide in this? I know <laughs> it's a weird thing because in schools, we've been going since for over 20 years, going into schools and talking about this issue. And one of the things that we have done over the years is bring fruit based gummies in so that we can do a little eating exercise with these ninth graders and invariably, and I stopped doing it well before the pandemic because there would be so many questions about, is this gluten-free? Is this sugar-free? Is this ninth graders? Ninth graders. And I God. just finally 
I can't eat this. My mom won't let me eat this. You know, well, we're just oh, going to do a little God. exercise. And the thing is like as big as your thumbnail. It's not even a big, <laughs> a big gummy, you know, <laughs> it's like, it just, you know, it just took over the conversation about whether this food was okay for a ninth grader to do an exercise with. It wasn't worth it to do it. And that is That's something that telling. we've done as the grown-ups in the world. We have made them afraid of a friggin' fruit-based gummy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> what so kind of, what wild. is this gummy made out of? Yeah. And I think it's important to ask what your food is made out of. But on the other hand, I've traveled all over the world and sometimes... I don't know what I'm eating, but I'm hungry and they gave it to me and I'm going to eat it. It's going to be fine. I'm, I have a human body. It can toxify anything. <laughs> <You know>? Exactly. <laughs> and it's like having that faith that our bodies can handle it. And I, it's interesting because obviously I'm such an advocate for like eating organic and not eating crap or processed food or whatever. But it, it's like widening the scope on what that means <laughs> and not being so, you know, crazy about yeah. it. Yeah. And we have this wonderful tool that is our body that will say that food makes me feel yucky, but this food makes me feel good. So I would like this food or, you know, that temperature or that texture. I don't like that, but I do like this. We've already got that. We don't have to like bite all of our fingernails off about what should I <laughs> eat for lunch because we have this really <laughs> wonderful part of us that says, yeah, I want soup, you know? <laughs> yes. No, I, that's how I feed myself. It's I have to be like, yum, like before I eat it. I have to have that feeling of, ooh, yay, like, or else oh. I just won't. Often that ooh, yay is like a wonderful, like organic grilled chicken salad like situation. And sometimes it's like a piece of sourdough bread, but it's just, I just will not. And that obviously sometimes you have to just eat what you're served course, or whatever, right especially ever. if you're a kid. Right. I'm an adult and I have control over what I eat. So, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I just don't want to eat things that are technically healthy, but I'm just like, what about I won't digest it. Yeah, I don't know. And again, who even knows? Because I'm old enough to remember when things were the devil. Sugar was the devil. And then sugar was OK, but fat was the devil. And then fat was OK and sugar went back to being the devil. And then you can't eat a carb. I mean, good Lord, no, mustn't. whatever it was, was always don't eat any meat. OK, only eat meat. And it's so confusing for us to have to, like, be told what to do when, again, we have this really good mechanism within ourselves that says, I don't care what that book says. I feel OK eating this. It's like people will do anything to get outside of their bodies. Yeah. And so we don't have that ability. Like we'll, you'll read a book to prescribe you what you should eat, like the grain brain or wheat belly or whatever that <laughs> and like, he'll give you the recipes, which are great, wonderful recipes, but we are so afraid of occupying our bodies, which is just, I think at the root of this, cause it's so painful in there. It's supposed to be sometimes. And like, we hate it. So yeah, well, again, you know, I thought when I was out there struggling with this, there was a part of me that thought if I could just dial it in perfectly, I wouldn't ever feel any pain or any worry or any sadness or, you know, I really did feel like I would be like a what a Barbie doll or something. I would look perfect and I'd be perfect and everything would be perfect, which of course doesn't happen, but I thought it would. And it's just such a like not rich way to experience the world, which I think takes such a leap of faith for people to cross over into, because when you're in that like control state, you only can feel that like level, that very like surface level of contentness. It's all, it's like a dopamine rush or whatever it is. And like, when you try to, you know, however you do it for me, it was like meditation and like really meditation retreats is what became my thing that occupy my body. <laughs> so great. <laughs> but like it, all of that other stuff dismantles and then you're like, who am I even without <laughs> yeah. that? Yes. Nothing until you fill it back up with actual human like life and real things. So. So tell me, why did you pick this specific card? 
Well, I picked it at random, to be honest. What spoke to you about that? Yeah, I didn't repick one <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, of course. Well, you know, the thing is with sexuality, I think it's so interesting that like it was basically, I think especially with girls, like in my teens, it was never, I mean, we had like sex ed, basically like here's how not to get pregnant, how not to get an STD. But like we never talked about sexual pleasure as like something to experience and we still don't really i mean no, like fringe podcasts do but it has taken me into like my late 20s you know i was i've been having sex since i was 16 and like <laughs> i don't know whatever and like you know probably good sex since i was 16 but it took me until like my late 20s to really like explore sexual pleasure and what that means in terms of like reclaiming that as an expression of human existence and not just this other like disjointed part of my life that it's all a part of occupying your body and I know I keep coming back to that but you can't access that if you're obsessed with what you look like and like your health for example or whatever it is well so many of women I know and even men that I know it's all around what their bodies look like and that will tell them whether they can even have sexual pleasure because if their bodies don't they don't like how their bodies look then they think the other person doesn't like how their bodies look and so oh, that's we're just doing a mechanical thing pretending that it's just fabulous and <laughs> our yeah. culture has just told us these lies about love and about sex and about sensuality. I mean, we just have been told so many terrible lies about it and so shaming and blaming and terrible, uh, you know. And so, yeah, nobody wants to even talk about this or even look at it. And I don't know if this is totally like outside the scope of this podcast but that just reminded me too of like shame about your sexual organs like that also we didn't talk about like like how many different ways a vagina can look and like <laughs> that has for sure came up for me in life where and like you know where friends are like wait just you're you know and it literally there was like I'm 30 like I said this last year ago, a couple of my friends and I were like, oh, you have that too. <laughs> like, I know. Was, why didn't we do this when we were 16? Like, you know, you we went through all these years thinking, is this weird? Yeah. Like, that's so bizarre to walk through the world wondering if something in your vagina is weird. Storygram Network. Welcome to One Media, One Media. I'm... <laughs> when you're It's a place I like to call The Bleed. My name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. The art of being yay isn't just something he developed. Storygram Network. I know, it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember many years ago when AIDS first started and then they decided, oh, this is how you get it. You have to be homosexual and you have to do this certain thing. Then other straight people started to get AIDS, you know, and countries like Nordic countries like Sweden and Denmark and Norway, they kind of got the idea what was going on. And so they right away started teaching sexual education. Like, this is how you get a disease or pregnant or this or that or this. So let's all try this uh, vibrator <laughs> so that you can get sexual pleasure without penetration, you know, well, and yeah. you can know how to work with each other about this, you know, and let's all learn how to put on a condom and let's all put, you know, it's like, sort of like brought this into kids that were third and fourth grade just to start talking about it. So by the time they got sexually active, they wouldn't be given a terminal illness. And uh, I just thought that was the most interesting thing I'd ever heard. The, the teachers just sprang into action, whereas here, right. we just close it down. No sex, otherwise you're going to die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just close it down. Yeah. Right. So I really, and I don't know that we're that much further than that idea here. 
than back then, you know, yeah. I don't see sexual education being taught in schools in a way that takes in pleasure and differences. Yeah, we need a radical like beyond hunger esque organization <laughs> to go into schools and t- teach about sexual pleasure because I mean, maybe with the Me Too movement, things have changed. But when I was like in high school, Oh God, we were just treated like total objects. And we didn't know that that was weird. We didn't know that we were supposed to be like as girls, like I'm not saying this doesn't happen to boys, but I, on, I mean, I only have my experience and I only hung out with girls in high school. <laughs> so like, we just didn't know that. And then if you did know you were kind of just like a slut, you know, if you did feel like the sex was for your pleasure and it was, yeah. Such kind an of looked outlier. at it like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of count of like how many people you had sex with. It was, it's just like, Oh, it, if it's too low, I remember feeling, Oh my God, I'm 16. Gotta do it. Hurry up, Megan. Like get it done. Yeah. <laughs> like it's all my chore. friends are doing it. <laughs> yes. Like just do it so that you're no longer a virgin. But yeah, I mean, I think also Marin County is a really particularly strange and can be toxic and also very free culture but yeah now that I've made friends with people all over the country you know it's like oh oh like, you didn't do that <laughs> I grew up in a really fast culture like yeah. didn't realize that yeah. <laughs> San Rafael high school Jesus. exactly I think that again that we're on the coast you know the coast kind of take stuff on and run with it, you know, <laughs> and yeah. uh, it's the middle of the country that's like, well, I don't know. Let me think about this for a minute. But exactly. I definitely, you know, there was that damned if you do and damned if you don't kind of an idea for me that I should have saved myself for whatever marriage I, <laughs> I was going to have. But then that would be then that's ostracizing and that's no good. Totally. But definitely you're not supposed to like it or at least you're not, I don't know. You know, there was a whole thing about, well, she really likes sex. She's a real slut. It's like, well, why does she get to like sex? <laughs> None of us do, you know, or whatever. It's so insane. No, I remember like my first like serious boyfriend I had like as an adult when I was 22. Like I, <laughs> I remember trying to make him think basically that I was like this Virgin Mary. Like I never said it. Like I obviously wasn't a virgin, but, and then obviously like we got closer and I was like, told him everything that had happened in my life. Yeah. It was a lot, but like, why did I do that? It was just like, cool. I think it went both. I think like the pendulum swings, like if this is attractive right now in culture to have a big butt, like 10 years ago, it was attractive to be completely flat and like just a stick or whatever. But what was attractive, it seemed like around 2014 was like for to like have barely had a lot like not had a lot of sex yeah <laughs> so I was like oh okay that'll make me attractive and that will stick with me yeah and it's all such a game instead of does this person me like this person that person you are we gonna get together just because we like each other and we're fitting together or there's all these other games that you have to play it's exhausting yeah, to create this like image of what you think is like the feminine or whatever. And, you know, so many of my clients, they've lived with their husband for years and the their husband has never seen them naked. They've never turned oh, on the light. Wow. They've never, so much shame, it's yeah. so much shame, so much body shame. And just, oh no, he'd leave me if he ever saw me. You know, it's like, believe me, he has seen you. <laughs> <laughs> you live in the same house he's seen you. Maybe he hasn't brought it up, but he has, and he's still here. So, yeah. No, I, I feel like also, like, what was really healing for me in terms of body stuff and sexual stuff in general was spending a lot of time in Latin America. And I'm obviously, like, I'm not saying I know I can compare cultures with any sort of definition, but it just seems like there was just a lot of larger bodied women just like dancing and just living their lives so much and being so sexual and just making out with their partners like on the streets and stuff <laughs> and it's oh you can occupy a lot of space and still be like really attractive and like have great sex yeah I know isn't it freeing but they're not as uh, neurotic about one size one color one age there they're like everybody gets to play 
Everybody gets to totally. eat. Everybody gets and to even go. In, even in Europe, I spent a lot of time in Switzerland and Italy, probably around that time too. And I was like 23 and these beautiful, like older women with long gray hair and they're just so in their sexuality and they walk around like everyone's staring at them. Like here, it's like women, I feel like over the age of 45 are like, oh, like, um, yeah, America's the worst. You know, I, I was thinking about this the other day is that we don't know what it's like to go through menopause because nobody talks about it or they do a little bit more now, but they didn't used to. And nobody knows what it's like to get wrinkles on your face because we get a little work done and nobody knows what it's like. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Nobody knows because we don't see that. And even if somebody does look like themselves, the media or the whoever just runs them down into the ground. Look how thick her ankles are. You know, really, this powerful woman, politician, we're talking about her ankles, really? That's where we need to go? And we don't do that so much to men. I mean, we do, but it's not so nitpicky. Oh, they can have so much more of a range of, like, how they're allowed to look to still, like, we're, like, it's attractive. Like, we give them so much room for... I know. They can look a lot of different ways and still be considered attractive. Right, and not with us very much at all. Anyway, so tell me what you're doing these days. What's your life like these days in your regular job and stuff? Yeah, well, I live in Los Angeles, which I shockingly... I'm obsessed with um, (laughs) because talking about all these topics uh, for one, but then yeah, growing up in NorCal in the Bay Area, we hate LA. LA sucks. There's no culture there. But um, (laughs) (laughs) right. But no, I find it to be like. So I lived in New York for undergrad and a little bit after, and that was just like totally unmanageable for me. It was way too stimulating. And but I like being in like a cultural center. So LA, especially the West Side, has that obviously cultural center feel but then it also feels like living in Marin in a way where it's just super nice and beautiful and easy to exist with the beach right there yes and I am currently a podcast producer for a small production company um, working on one right now particularly about teen mental health so that's been very interesting I transitioned from I was like working in tech and marketing through like half of my twenties and then went to grad school at USC down here for journalism. Then I did some print text work for like a year and then just got randomly kind of transitioned into the audio world. Um, so we'll see what happens moving forward, but yeah. And you like it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I love journalism. Fabulous. It's so great. It's so great. It's exactly what I've always wanted to do. And now I'm like, I have that shame about like, God, if only I, you know, speaking of occupying our bodies and like eating what we want and doing what we like, like, it's the same thing with your career stuff. Like I was too obsessed with so many other things when I was 18 through 22 or whatever. And even after that, to think about what I wanted to do. And like, so I was just like, okay, make money. So I'm not a loser. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and right. and be miserable because you hate tech. But now I'm like, gosh, if I had gone to journalism schools undergrad, but you know, it all happens for a reason. And it, it was does. nice to make money at the time. So <laughs> it does. It's sort of like the other part of uh, recovery is to trust the process is that if you had gone before, you might not be where you are right now because you didn't have these other skills that you got along the way in order to do this. Yeah. Now you might not have even known it. And who in the hell even talked about podcast five years ago? Not very many people, you know, and exactly. It's just a weird, see what door opens and go through that one. Cause it might be in your life. It might be many different things that you do. I think it will be. I'm feeling that. <laughs> I'm like, I want to open a restaurant next. So wow. we'll, see what, we'll see what happens. Megan's. <laughs> yeah, it's called Megan's. That's great. <laughs> it's a franchise. Yeah, I love it. New Mel's Diner. Yeah. I love it. I'll come down for the opening for sure. Great. So you have a little soapbox right here, a little platform. Do you want to get anything out into the world that you've been thinking about or working on or... You mean in terms of my work or like... Or whatever, just, you know, there's people who listen to this. They're all over the country, all over the world, really. And we have anything you really want to get through to them about 
what you've learned and what you think is important. Mm, Yeah, man, so much. I mean, this topic is the most important thing in the world to me of like, I mean, I've kind of moved away from like the eating disorder. I mean, that's not what this is either. It's about like intuitive eating and all that stuff. But even thinking about it in terms of the physical aesthetic experience, like I said, it very much for me moved to the health controlling experience. And I've just learned so much about like trauma and how that affects your health and very much in that world. What I went through when I started having health problems, like health problems that so many women have, like chronic fatigue, hormonal issues, weird autoimmune stuff that doctors look at you like you're crazy. You know, it's like, I hardly even have to say the words and women like you're doing right now know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I like, you know, went on the medical medium diet and (laughs) (laughs) because I was like, I will die if I don't. (laughs) Right. And my entire days, once again, after I'd completely detached from like my physical appearance, it really was not obviously about that. I just wanted to feel well, but it was the same thing of waking up forcing myself to make this stupid celery juice and then drink the stupid, <laughs> disgusting smoothies. I don't want a cold smoothie in the morning <laughs> or really ever. And, and I, I was just like, I was getting sicker and I was just like, this is going to tie into the eating disorder stuff in a I second, it. but it's <laughs> getting sicker and sicker doing all the perfect things, being the perfect specimen of like someone who's recovering from an autoimmune disorder and putting myself in this stupid bath every night and taking infrared saunas and going to acupuncture and all this stuff. And then it was just like my whole life was control about my physical experience in the world. And a lot of that actually was deciding to go back to school and like choosing what I wanted to do and taking a leap and thinking like, even if I don't feel well, I can do this. And, um, just giving up on, I think, it, I don't know, it was like a combination of like therapists saying, maybe you don't want to eat this way anymore. If you don't feel well. <laughs> <You're> like, I, <laughs> really? Can I? <laughs> and I kept telling myself it's because I'm not doing it perfectly enough. It's because I had a little canola. It was just, it's just hell. You had one Frito. And so yeah. all is lost. Oh, it's absolutely, it was never, a fr- I would never have a Frito. It was like, <laughs> it was like I had canola oil at that restaurant. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. It was so, I know exactly it was what you mean. Pathological. Looking back, I just I cannot believe that was my existence. So I think these health problems are not going away. And I think we're really realizing the trauma piece in it, which is what I explored and could talk about all the things I did to explore that for a century. But it's never about food, like to, to get it, um, you know, as long as you're eating generally well, feeding yeah. yourself, it's like, I just find all of this like health obsessed food will fix all of your health problems. If you eat in a, in the proper way, like to be so toxic and not saying that can't be the cure for some people. I've never seen it, but I think it could be perhaps, but yeah, I just hope nobody forces them to selves to do the medical medium diet um, <laughs> ever no. if they don't want to. <laughs> but it, there's so much money in it. There's so much money in making us afraid of food or afraid of our bodies, afraid of our sexuality, afraid of our power. There's so much money in that. And, it, you know, you got to follow the money to see who's really pulling the strings. And so I tell my clients, what do you want to do? And they're like, what should I do? No, no. <laughs> what do you want to do? <laughs> and I, I was tell a very, me. yeah, I was a very young mother. Everybody around me told me, oh, you got to, at that time, you know, if you fed your baby with a bottle, you had to boil the bottles and boil the nipple and the parts of the bottle. And there was just this rigmarole that you had to do all the time. And I remember doing that and anything that he touched had to be boiled or he'd get sick and die. I mean, it was really like that kind of a life and death situation. And I had to do his clothes separate. And I mean, there was just so many things like that. And then he was a little kid and he was sitting out in the backyard one day and I looked over at him and he was eating bugs. And I went, I wonder why in the world I (laughs) do 
<laughs> a whole year of sterilizing everything. And here he is sitting, a little boy out in the yard, eating a bug. And I really have no control over this. <laughs> That's the word, though. It's sterilizing. It's like whether it's to look a certain way or to feel a certain way, it's like we're trying to sterilize our environment so much. Fix them, put so many good probiotics in our microbiome that like <laughs> no yeast can get Nothing in there gets whatever. in, right. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, that's not how we become happy and feel well. It's like having good embodied sex and eating when you're hungry and having good relationships and not doing work you hate. It's like not, it's pretty simple maybe taking some supplements or maybe some medicine if there is medicine that helps for whatever you're dealing with. But it's like, yeah, this uh, culture. Yeah. Movement the way that you want. Yeah. forgot. That Don't too. worry about whether you're burning carbs or doing steps, you know, just move your body the way that it wants to move. Again, I think we can look at these older cultures, older than America, because we're a young culture and see what are they doing? Well, they're getting out at night and walking the Zocalo and going to a dance party. That looks fun. so fun. <laughs> God, we have such little fun as Americans. And that's another thing I really like about LA is I just, I feel like there is that part of that culture where like, I don't know if it's because there's a lot of Latin influence here, but like, and like a huge Hispanic population, but there is a lot of focus on fun. There's and a lot of I fun. Think Right. I think that's very important. I think that's true. Every time I go to LA, I feel like, ooh, fun. There's going to be fun <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, like tanning and then like, yeah. let's get food and then like, let's work as little as possible. Exactly. Because <laughs> like, the sun is out. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Well, Megan, I'm so happy that you were here today. And I wonder if you'll read that very last part just for today. Today, I will practice realizing it is not my size that limits my sexual experience, but rather it is my shame and fear, the same feelings that are so often at the core of my struggle with food and weight. I will experiment with looking at my body, the expression of my sexuality and my sexual desires as natural, pure, precious and sacred. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you so much for being on and being out in the world and doing this work still in whatever way you are, and you will continue to do so. And of I just course. really, you know, just I remember you in high school and I just felt again that we never know how people feel inside. But I thought, man, she's got her <laughs> together. I didn't have my <laughs> together at that age at all, you know. <laughs> But, you know, we're judging the outsides. But I was really crying about my boyfriend during the breaks, like oh, on the phone I with know. him, probably. Like. I know. But also, <laughs> it just feels like you got through it and you did it with support. You had some support. And then even when you kind of hit a wall, you knew what to do at some point. You knew to trust yourself and to trust your body. Well, I'm so grateful for this education I had that most people don't, you know, at the exactly the right time. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much and say hello to LA and I will. I have two wonderful people I love very much down there. So I do fly in every once in a while. I'll be sure to give you a text. Yes. Let's go for a walk in the sun. Yay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for listening. You can find me on all the social medias at It's Not About Food. And if you would like to get the show a week early and ad free, you can become a member at Patreon. Search It's Not About Food podcast. Thanks so much. <laughs>